Log on to patreon.com forward slash Dane Calloway or paypal.me forward slash Dane Calloway to support me, my channel, and my content. Merchandise is now available at I'm just here to make you think.com. If you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read it, you're misinformed. Uh, what do you do? That's a great question. What is the long-term effect of too much information? One of the effects is the need to be first, not even to be true anymore. So what a responsibility you all have. To be, to tell the truth. Not just to be first, but to tell the truth. We live in a society now where it's just first. Who cares? Get it out there. We don't care who it hurts. We don't care who we destroy. We don't care if it's true. Just say it. Sell it. Sell it. Sell it. Sell it. I was wondering about our yesterdays and digging through the rubble. And to say the least, somebody went to a hell of a lot of trouble to make sure that when we looked things up, we wouldn't fare too well. And we would come up with totally unreliable pictures of ourselves. But I've compiled what few facts I could, I mean, such as they are, to see if we could find out a little bit of something. And this is what I got so far. First, white folks discovered Africa. They claimed it fair and square. Cecil Rhodes couldn't have been robbing nobody because hell, there wasn't nobody there. The white folks brought all the civilization because there wasn't none around. How could the folks be civilized when wasn't nobody writing nothing down? And just to prove all of their suspicions, well, didn't take too long. They found out that there were whole tribes of people in plain sight, running around with no clothes on. That's right. The men, the women, the young and the old righteous folks covered their eyes. And no time was spent considering the environment. Hell no, this just wasn't civilized. And another piece of information they had, or at least this is what we were taught, is that unlike the civilized people of Europe, these tribal units actually fought. And yes, there was some crude implements, and yes, there was primitive art, and yes, they were masters of hunting and fishing, and courtesy came from the heart. And yes, there was love and medicine, religion, intertribal communication by drum, but no paper, no pencils, and no other utensils, and hell, these folks never even heard of a gun. And this is why the colonies came, to stabilize the land because the dark continent had copper and gold and the discoverers had themselves a plan. They would discover all the places with promise. You didn't need no titles and deeds. Then they would appoint people to make everything legal to sanction the trickery and greed. And back in the jungle, when the natives got restless, they would call it guerrilla attack. And they would never describe that the folks finally got wise and decided that they would fight back. And still, we are victims of word games. Semantics is always a bitch. Places once referred to as underdeveloped are now called mineral rich. And the game goes on eternally. Unity kept just beyond reach. Egypt and Libya used to be in Africa. They've now been moved to the Middle East. There are examples galore, I assure you. But if interpreting were left up to me, I'd be sure every time folks knew this version wasn't mine, which is why it is called his story. People of today's society in America have been misinterpreting and also misrepresenting what a fact actually means, and it is all due to what they have been indoctrinated and conditioned to believe how a fact is psychologically and socially determined. For example, a person would normally consider traditional information given to them to be a fact without noticing that they just inadvertently allowed someone's opinion to be considered valuable as a source of creditable information. In other words, just because someone else states repetitive information that you may have heard about before during let's say your school days or your teenage years for example, 
does not necessarily mean that the information given is true. If you shouldn't judge a book by its cover and your parents informed you as a child that you should never talk to strangers, then why would a person believe that someone else's opinion is a fact when the people that gave you this information is a total stranger and you're allowing them to do your thinking for you? Let's begin with number one. As the story goes in American history, 90% of the Indian population in North America were killed off by way of smallpox and other diseases. It was said that due to the lack of prior contact with these incoming foreigners and not being previously exposed to these diseases, that the Indian's internal immune system was not equipped to combat what these pale-faced foreigners allegedly brought with them to these lands. Now, this is where logical, critical thinking comes into play, and you simply question everything. Like, some of you can recall having chicken pox, maybe when you were a child. Does chicken pox lay dormant inside of you forever? What about a common cold? Or even the flu for that matter? Does it stick around even after your immune system defeats it? And if it does, then for how long? History says that these diseases arose in Europe and Africa. And when you look at what the impact of these diseases had on their population, people survived. And this was way before vaccinations were even created and mandated. So the question remains, how could these foreigners bring these same diseases to North America and decimate the American Indian population to near extinction and not have had the exact same thing done over there within countries much smaller than North America alone? Let's move on to number two. You can recall the story of slavery throughout American history and how we are all told that allegedly 12.5 million enslaved Africans were brought to the Americas by way of slave ships between 1619 and 1875. However, history fails to mention or document how many whites it took to accomplish that. Or does it? First, let's go over a few very important things that are relevant to this subject. Like, according to more commonly known world maps of today, which derived from the Mercator world map of 1569, Europe is somehow located above or rather north of Africa. However, before it was colonized and named Europe, that particular land has always been one large landmass, meaning that there was no imaginary dividing line to separate it to begin with. So in this sense, Europe is and has always been a part of the lands that are commonly referred to as Africa, and the people residing throughout these lands would be considered as Africans. Now, History displays the number of alleged slaves who were brought to the Americas from foreign areas, leaving scholars or rather students who are being taught American history to contemplate, wonder and assume who these slaves actually are based solely on the biased information given to them by way of compulsory educational institutions. This process is called indoctrination which is, quote, the process of teaching a person or group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically. Uncritically meaning, quote, with a lack of criticism or consideration of whether something is right or wrong, end quote. 
According to the very first U.S. Census that was established in the year 1790, there were three categories listed for the enumerators to classify individuals that they meet in person. One being slaves, then free whites, and then all other free. Notice that the category free whites includes the word free. Free from what? Free from who? The 1790 U.S. Census recorded a total population count of just over 3.9 million people. However, marshals and other government officials admitted to the lack of not being able to properly record all inhabitants of this land as expected due to the multiple indigenous Niji raids and wars that were already in progress during this time period, making the final population count royally inaccurate. What is also important to note is that the majority of the U.S. Census records and other vital documents from the year 1790 to 1910 were purposely lost and or damaged by way of fire, water, and smoke. This hideous action was heavily influenced by the likes of Walter Plecker, the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, and many other things that I have previously covered and will be covering again in a later planned documentary. But I said that to say this, does this sound as if someone or somebodies have something to hide? History loves to claim that the so-called enslaved Africans arrived in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619 first. However, I previously debunked this theory in full by researching documents and records held by both the National Archives of Spain and England and their associated historic libraries. The truth is that the famous quote stated by John Roth was misquoted several times and that the story of what really happened was hidden. John Roth's famous quote was changed by the Department of Historic Resources to read, quote, 20 and odd Africans from its original passage that read, quote, 20 and odd Negroes in which both of these quotes are incorrect, according to John Rawls' journal held by the National Archives of London, England. The original quote written by John was, quote, 20 and odd Negras, referring to females of a darker skin complexion of the West Indies. Also, history lied about the location of their arrival for a reason. The first 20 and odd Negras did not arrive in Jamestown. They arrived in Point Comfort, Virginia, later known as Fort Monroe, VA, but now known as Hampton, Virginia today. You may watch my previous documentaries on this topic by using the links above and in the description of this video. The 20 and odd Negras never settled here in North America. In fact, they were allegedly turned away by the colonists due to not being in condition to perform indigent servitude duties. So they were sent away to be returned to the West Indies, also known during that time period as the East Indies. Now, the actual slaves that immigrated here in North America during the years 1619 and beyond arrived in James City and Plymouth, Massachusetts simultaneously in order to create and establish the very first and second colonies of North America. Now, history claims that the first colony established in North America was Virginia by Captain John Smith in 1607. However, according to unclassified documents and records concerning the Company of Virginia, or rather the Virginia Company of London, a charter was awarded to the Virginia Company by King James in order to establish a colony in Virginia, but King James did not approve the colony of Virginia until the year 1627 by the time a fourth and much smaller charter was approved and a governor was appointed by James himself. Now, what does all of this mean? Well. Keep in mind that history also states that Captain John Smith sailed from London, England to Plymouth, Massachusetts in the year 1614 
and also named an important river after King Charles I that same year. But here's the problem with that. According to the tales of American history, Charles, the son of James, was not King of England and Scotland until March 27, 1625. And according to the statutes at large, being of all the laws of Virginia, in the Henning Statutes of Virginia, Volume 1, James was still King of England and Scotland when he gave the royal approval to establish the Virginia Colony in 1627, two years after Charles was allegedly in office as King. Also, that important river that I just mentioned was allegedly called Charles River by King Charles and Captain John Smith. But this was all a lie, and here's why. Nowadays, American history loves to claim that Charleston, or rather originally known as Charlestown, South Carolina, was the major port allegedly used to import thousands of so-called African slaves into North America. But history purposely fails to tell you that the port was not in Charlestown, South Carolina but rather in Charlestown, Massachusetts, which is known today as Boston, Massachusetts, but originally called the Plymouth Colony of 1619, which was the true area that African slaves arrived to in North America during their journey from Europe, or rather Africa. The pale faces who traveled here were labeled as pilgrims, knights, gentlemen, merchants, and adventurers by American history, but they were all technically employees, laborers, peasants, who assumed the belief of their freedom, but yet still under the dominion of the King of Scotland in England. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. Our destiny is tied up in the destiny of America. Before the Pilgrim Fathers landed at Plymouth, we were here. We were here. We were here. Moving on to number three. Throughout American history, one of the most commonly used statements that will be considered as a fact of opinionated history is that Spanish master navigator and explorer Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492 with help from Moroccan or rather Iberian servants who were familiar with navigating the waters of the shores. Now before I go any further, I want you to quickly make note of the word discover and its actual meaning. The word discover is commonly used to reference when something is exposed or made known, for originally it was a secret or hidden to the public, but now all is revealed. So now, if Christopher Columbus allegedly discovered America, that would not mean that he found new lands. No, it simply means that the people who sent him were already aware of these lands' existence along with its people who were already inhabiting it. This also means that if the Christopher Columbus story that we were all told is actually true, then history and its writers are purposely mistitling his position as a navigator and explorer. Why is this, you ask? Well, since someone gave Christopher Columbus royal permission to be granted access to explore these lands in hopes of immediate relocation and settlement for their people, then that does make Christopher Columbus a discoverer, only because a discoverer originally meant informant during this time period. As the story goes, Christopher Columbus reported back to someone, right? And somehow his alleged story was documented. But it royally fails to mention that the true asterisk by his name should read spy.
And finally, number four, people have been told many different things concerning the Underground Railroad story, and somehow the story is being carried out as if it was just a myth. In some instances, some history tellers would say that the Underground Railroad had nothing to do with a railroad or even being underground. But just like numerous things that are considered to be American history today, this opinion that we were all told is false. People who were born between the 1950s and beyond were told that the Underground Railroads were safe houses for runaway slaves, while people who were born in the 1930s and earlier were told that the Underground Railroads were actual railroads that people utilized in order to vacate their jobs. The significant differences between both stories is quite obvious, but just in case you were wondering why, let's go over why the phrase runaway slave was used later on in history books and other correlating curriculums. You can recall how the story of slavery goes. A slave master is the owner of those he or she enslaved and that a slave's daily duty was commonly rather known as a laborer for his or her owner or slave master. The truth is that a so-called slave master's position was literally the employer, no matter their hue of complexion, and the so-called slave's position was literally the employee. The majority of people today are at-will employees, and the contract that you sign in order to become employed by a company means that you can quit or be released from your job at will. But during so-called slavery times, these same contracts were binding for much longer periods of time. Once or if your contract expires, you were then released or freed from all duties. So. When you hear the story of a person escaping via the Underground Railroad, this was a person that was attempting to leave their job before the expiration of their binding contracts, if they had one. So why was it an Underground Railroad? Because even the right of transit for a slave, or rather a fugitive, was denied if their contract was not completed. So. What is the Underground Railroad? Upon the arrival of foreigners, they discovered a transportation system that ran both above and underground. This transportation system was previously designed to run from coast to coast, aligning parallel with the canals and rivers throughout North America. The expansiveness of these ancient railway structures was so great in numbers that it was very difficult for any foreigner to even attempt to regulate them all during this time period and even the days of so-called slavery. Now, you can get an idea of what these underground railroads looked like if you were to visit, say, your local train stations, for example. Upon close examination, you will notice that there are usually two to three sets of tracks, in which one set typically includes a left side track and a right side track. In more common use areas, only two sets out of a possible three are being used today, leaving one to wonder why one set of tracks are currently not in use. According to the routes that are displayed on the maps of the Underground Railroads, they directly correlate with the same routes of service that are still being used today, and even with some of the much older railway destinations that has since been removed, and also with portions of the railway system that ran deep underground. Now, I know what you're thinking. Everything is not a conspiracy, but not everything happens out of pure coincidence, neither. A great amount of these much older and more narrow-like tracks ran through hundreds of different mines that led directly into a variety of mounds and mountains throughout the lands, and only the people that were familiar with these routes could conduct a method of transportation for others who are seeking freedom, or rather seeking to quit their jobs. A 
America's history's most famous trophy to use when it comes to campaigning the so-called slave story that was alleged to have occurred here in North America is none other than Harriet Tubman. In the year 1896, at a suffrage convention, or rather a voting convention for women's rights in New York, Harriet Tubman was allegedly quoted stating the following. I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger." End quote. What's very interesting to note about this quote is that she indicated to the public what her job's description and position was for eight years with the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman acknowledged that she was literally a train conductor, in which a train conductor is responsible for the overall operations of rail systems and safety measures for its oncoming passengers. So in this quote, which was said to have been stated by Harriet Tubman directly, she admits to performing her duties without error, while also indicating that she cannot say the same for other conductors of the Underground Railroad. So the question remains, how was Harriet Tubman cognizant of the routes ranging from southern to northern parts of these lands and all the way to Canada with her being an alleged runaway slave? And how is it that Harriet Tubman hinted that it was more than one conductor of the Underground Railroad but she was the only one chosen to be duly noted by American history. Who are the others? What is also very important to note here is that many of the locations that were originally known and listed as stations were later changed to be described as safe houses. For example, on October 10th, 1980, a House Resolution Act was passed by Congress that allowed for the establishment of the Boston African American National Historic Site, the African American Meeting House, and it also allowed for the creation and development of the free African American community within the Beacon Hill area in Boston, Massachusetts. This 1980 Act was signed into law to grant executive authorization, or rather, quote, cooperative agreements between the Secretary of the Interior of the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service Department to choose any, quote, sufficient properties within the boundary of the site and can determine that, quote, area as the Boston African American National Historic Site. The copper-colored residents of the Beacon Hill area were already suffering from an undergoing gentrification process by way of the government during this time period, and politicians with political power thought it would be a great opportunity to cover a lie with another lie, and another lie, and then another lie. And here's why. Particular properties of the Beacon Hill area, whether publicly or privately owned, were chosen by the secretary to immediately become official historic locations taught throughout American history and even African American history. And many of these chosen locations were in fact not the original location of the story it represents. In fact, the famously known Hayden House of Boston, Massachusetts was chosen by the Secretary of the Interior as a safe house of the Underground Railroad, in which he commissioned the National Center for the Study of Afro-American History and Culture that same year in order to create the story behind it, knowing that their story is absolutely not true. Now in conclusion, people would say that history was written by the victors, and that's the reason why history is the way it is. 
but I will have to disagree with them merely because only a loser will have the audacity to write a story to make it seem as if they won when they didn't. I'm just here to make you think.